Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. Today's show is a very important one, particularly for families with sophomores and juniors especially juniors, because a lot is happening with respect to testing and AP exams and test optional schools and many other late breaking developments. Most are Corona related, but not all. So I strongly urge you to listen to this show with your child, sit around the kitchen table together, put the phones down, turn the TV off and give it a listen together. It's an absolute must for juniors and a very good idea for sophomores. But before I jump in, I want to first off congratulate all of the prep wellers out there, especially this year's juniors, who have stuck with the prep well plan over the last two and a half years. You know who you are. I know it wasn't always easy, and many of your friends wondered why you were so engaged in the college admissions process in freshman and sophomore year. Why were you getting such an early jump on things? Why not just wait until junior year like everybody else? Well, now those friends know why. The plan, so to speak, refers to my thesis that insists that early preparation for college admissions gives students a disproportionate advantage in almost every dimension. Early preparation. In fact, I famously claim that 70% of your college application will already be spoken for before you step one foot into junior year. You can check out my blog post. It's called The Golden Years or my very first podcast if you want more details about where I get this statistic. This thesis is the premise of my entire business. And there's no better illustration of why it works than what's happening with this corona shutdown. Yes, this is an extreme example. This is a black swan moment, but it highlights the point well. Because the students that bought into the PrepWell plan and followed my advice are in extremely good shape right now, disproportionately good shape. Why? Because their SAT or ACT testing is done. Their extracurriculars are well-developed. They've spent their summers wisely They've secured leadership positions. They've built strong relationships with their teachers. They've visited colleges. They know their guidance counselors well. They've achieved good grades. And they've taken challenging courses. It's all done. Many of my best prep wellers can apply to college right now without the benefit of spring or summer. They weren't counting on spring and summer of junior year. That's all gravy for them. This is where you want to be because you just never know what could happen. So for all of those sophomores out there who are wondering how they can avoid some or all of the angst that juniors are experiencing right now, I suggest you pay attention because you're next up in the breach. How are you going to approach this process? Are you going to wait and procrastinate and be like everybody else and assume everything will be okay? Or will you take action? I've been receiving and consolidating a lot of questions from prep wellers and prospective prep wellers all across the country. And now since the airing of my Shark Tank segment, even more so. And today, I'm going to do my best to answer those questions. Most of them are highly relevant for juniors, but absolutely important for sophomores as well. And even if you have younger children, you'll get a sneak peek into some of the issues and the challenges that lie ahead of you. So here are some of the questions. Question number one. Because of coronavirus, more colleges seem to be going test optional, which means it's not required to submit an SAT or ACT score. Even UC schools are going test optional, 
with this in mind, do I still need to study for the SAT or ACT, or should I just not worry about it? Question number two, will it now be easier to get into UC schools since they can't compare everyone's standardized test scores? Question number three, what does test optional mean anyway? Question number four, what are the chances that the June 6th SAT gets canceled? What about the July ACT? Question number five, what's going to happen when and if they open up more testing dates for the SAT or ACT? Question number six, what about SAT subject tests? Do they matter anymore? Question number seven, how should I approach AP exams now that they will be taken at home for only 45 minutes each? Question number eight, what do I do now that my spring and summer extracurriculars have essentially gone away? Question number nine, why should I bother staying engaged in this online learning business, studying for tests? Isn't everything just shut down? Number 10, if I have good test scores, will they even matter? What are the chances that schools will go test blind? Question number 11, what should I do during my downtime? And question number 12, will first semester grades senior year matter more than in years past? Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to go through these questions one by one. First question, because of coronavirus, more schools are going test optional, which means it's not required to submit an ACT or SAT score. Even UC schools are going test optional. With this in mind, do I still need to study for the SAT or ACT, or should I just not worry about it? Well, the answer is yes. If you have the means and the time, you should continue to study for one or both of these tests. And I'll discuss a little bit later why it might be both, which cuts against conventional wisdom and my past advice, and we'll discuss why that's the case. And here's why you should continue studying. First off, not every college is going test optional. Just because UC schools just announced for this year only that they're going test optional should not cloud your thinking. This move to test optional is relatively slow moving. We're talking about hundreds of schools on that test optional list versus thousands of schools that are not test optional. So if you give up now on studying for the SAT or ACT, assuming that you'll only apply to test optional schools, but then decide later to apply to a school that does require a test score, you're going to be in bad shape. Don't cut off your options, especially now that you have so much downtime to study during this shutdown. The shutdown is great news for students who need or want extra time to prepare for these tests. It's a gift. So take advantage of it. Don't run away from it. In addition to this, if you choose not to take the SAT or ACT and don't submit any scores to test optional schools, they will have to put more weight on the other parts of your application. Are you confident that the rest of your application will be sufficiently strong that it will withstand this additional scrutiny? Application readers with less score data will have to rely on other parts of your application. Are you prepared for that? Maybe. How are your extracurriculars? What about leadership? Did you crush every summer break? How's your GPA? What about your essays and letters of recommendation? Are you prepared to compete on those items alone? This can be risky, especially if you have the time and the access and the motivation to study for an SAT or ACT. Why would you give that up? And lastly, and we'll cover this again in a few minutes, if you have any intention of earning any merit scholarships, that is grants from colleges that don't have to be paid back, that are offered to you because of your high academic merits, then don't skip the SAT or ACT. You will, in many cases, remove yourself from contention for most merit scholarship aid awards. And wouldn't that be a shame? Next question. Will it be easier to get into UC schools, that's University of California schools now, since they won't necessarily see everyone's SAT or, or ACT score? The answer is no, it will not be. 
By most estimates, it will be even more selective. Why is that the case? For one, UC dropping this testing requirement will likely encourage more students to apply, students that otherwise would not have applied, and more applications means more competition. And during this economic downturn, many students will intentionally apply to more UC schools, maybe even exclusively, because pound for pound, UC schools tend to be less expensive for California residents than would be comparable schools in other states. Not always, but often. And during this social upheaval, many families will want their children to stay closer to home, increasing the number of students looking to stay in California. And this leads us to the next question. What is test optional anyway? Does it make it easier to get into schools or harder? Will all schools eventually go test optional? Well, test optional means that there is not a requirement to submit an SAT or ACT score. It doesn't mean that everyone who applies to these schools does not submit their scores. Most still do, especially at the more competitive schools. Just because the UC schools are test optional for this year doesn't mean that UC admission standards are going down. The most competitive candidates will still submit their test scores, even though it's optional and you'll still have to compete against them. Consider this. When the University of Chicago first went test optional, their average test score went up by 15 points from the prior year. And their admit rate went down from 7.2% to 5.9%. Test optional does not mean easier to get into. It can often mean harder to get into because they sometimes attract more applicants, i.e. people who haven't taken tests. Now, in terms of will all schools eventually go test optional, very unlikely. Now, while there's a raging debate about whether or not standardized test scores are predictive of success in college or life or whether they're fair or unfair, they still provide colleges with an important, if imperfect, measure of academic horsepower, if you will, that can be used to compare students across the nation. Most of us see the test optional list growing, but we don't see a wholesale change to test optional in the mid or near future. Next question. What are the chances that the June 6th SAT gets canceled? And the same question for the July ACT. For the June SAT, most believe at this point that there's less than a 50-50 chance that the test will happen. In other words, it's more likely not to happen than happen. Nobody has the data to make this prediction quite yet. And most believe that the yes-no decision will be based on whether or not schools ever get back in session before the summer. If schools do not begin to reconvene in the physical classroom by June, it's hard to believe that the June SAT will go on. With respect to the July ACT, the same thing. We just don't know right now. The odds might be a little bit higher, maybe a few extra weeks of time, but we don't know. The bottom line is that you should still hedge your bets, at least a little bit, and make sure that you're studying for these exams now in case the corona clouds clear and students go back to school and they decide to stick with the current schedule. And if they end up canceling or postponing this exam, you will still have built up a strong foundation of studying that will not go to waste. Now, there is the possibility that once the corona dust settles, that the testing boards decide to add more testing dates in late summer or fall to satisfy this building latent demand out there. In other words, there is a very high likelihood that there will be ample opportunities to take these tests before it's time to apply to college. So don't blow it off. Don't assume that it's not going to happen. What does that mean for you? Well, for one, you better be ready to register for those new test dates when and if they're added. The demand will be so great that if you're not paying attention and you miss the announcement about the new testing dates, it's possible that you won't get a seat. All the seats may be gone. They may be taken in a matter of minutes. So pay attention. 
if there are too many students vying for too few seats, there may actually be some type of rationing for spots. In other words, the testing boards may have to lay out a policy for who gets the open seats. Priority may go to students who have not yet taken a test or to students who are receiving fee waivers, or to students who require accommodations. We don't know. And this leads me to another suggestion, which is that it may behoove you to keep an open mind about which test to prepare for, SAT or ACT. If you're dead set on the ACT right now, but all the seats are taken, you may want to have the flexibility to take the SAT instead. Now, that's not what I suggest in normal times, but we're not operating in normal times. It's crazy land right now. So you may want to hedge your bets and be prepared for either test just in case. Because I believe it's important to do everything you can to secure at least one score on one of these two tests. There is an unlikely scenario that I hope we don't see that the SAT and ACT boards are preparing for and considering. They're actually thinking about the option of a take at home SAT or ACT. As most of you know, the AP tests are doing that this year. They're going to be at home, and that just might pave the way for the SAT or ACT if things continue to deteriorate. I wouldn't worry about that so much right now, but understand that that may come to pass if things remain really bad. What about SAT subject tests? Should I even bother with these anymore? Again, it might be tempting to deprioritize SAT subject tests, which by most accounts are losing some of their steam, but I would hesitate taking such an approach, especially now. I know it's counterintuitive because many colleges are moving away from caring about these scores, but given the situation this year, these scores can add some much needed evidence to your portfolio. Don't forget, most juniors will have questionable grades, if you will, for the second half of their junior year. Some schools are being forced to give grades as pass-fail, and others are locking in grades as of March. Everyone's different. So colleges will likely give less credit to those grades. That means they have less information to judge you on. That means that if you can do something to give them confidence, that you really are great in U.S. history or math or bio or chemistry, you should do it. It's on you to present the best picture you can of yourself. Now, that normally means more info, not less. You want to make the admissions reader's job easier, not harder. The same goes for AP exams. These tests that used to be three to four hours are now going to be 45-minute at-home exams. How are schools going to look at the results of these scores? They're going to be questionable. So once again, if you have the opportunity to shine by crushing a few SAT subject tests, which are well-known for years and years and years, there's no shortcuts here, why not do it? Next question. While we're on the topic of AP exams, some students are wondering, should they even take them? Since most schools don't require you to submit an AP exam final score anyway. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but the same principle holds. Why would you decide not to take an exam that will give you an opportunity to show what you know and how well you know it. Other than the obvious, you don't feel like doing it, or you're lazy, or it's not convenient. An exam that will give you the chance to show that you've mastered the material, even if it's not as legitimate as it was in past years, even if it doesn't cover the full year's worth of content, why give the application reader any doubt? If they've seen that you've taken three or four AP classes, but you decided not to take the final exam or not to submit your scores, on a 45-minute at-home exam, what will that lead them to believe? Put yourself in their shoes. Do you think that they're just going to ignore that? And what if you plan to have an AP teacher write you a letter of recommendation? Wouldn't it be odd if you decided not to take the AP exam in that class? Quite the contrary. You should be doing your best to crush that exam so that that teacher will give you high marks. And lastly, You've probably seen that there are now two AP testing date options, one in May, the early one, and one in June, the later one. Any idea which one you should take? The early one or the late one? Good answer. Yes, the early one. 
The second one should be a backup in case of emergency. If you roll the dice and only register for the second one and something goes wrong, you sleep late, the internet's down, your Wi-Fi's messed up, you're sick, it's too loud, your computer freezes, whatever it might be, you're left empty-handed. Prepare for the first one, the early one, and do your best to nail it and be done. Next question. What do I do now that my spring and summer extracurricular activities have essentially gone away? I've addressed this at length in the last few podcasts, episode 24 and 25, so I won't go into great detail here, but the trick is to accept that your spring and summer plans have been canceled or nearly canceled and figure out creative ways to demonstrate what you really care about anyway, or maybe spend this extra time actually thinking about what you really care about, reflecting on it, researching it. This is a luxury that most juniors never have. Congratulations. Embrace this time and sit back and reflect on your life. No, it's not quite as easy as shadowing someone in an office building or working in a traditional internship. But with the internet and Zoom and online learning platforms, the sky is the limit. This time is a gift that will give you the freedom to create your own path instead of going down a more well-worn path. You now have the license to do this. Take advantage of it. Next question. Why should I even bother staying engaged in this online learning or studying for tests? It's so inefficient. Is it even worth it? My friends aren't doing anything. Okay, apart from the obvious, which is to better yourself, if you're motivated and you care a lick about where you're going to college or do for a next step, now it's even more important to differentiate yourself with whatever tests or grades or projects you have left before the summer. There's less information to go on. So everything you do now has more significance. Now, you can sit back and think of this as added stress and pressure, or you can look at this as an opportunity to do great things while the average student shuts it all down. Keep in mind, if you plan to apply for merit scholarships, that is money that colleges will give you to entice you to go to their school, guess what determines merit scholarships? mostly. Test scores. Yes, test scores. They might ask for some other information from applicants, but really, they dole out money based on test scores. So if you want or need to secure merit scholarships to make college finances more feasible, it's time to get back to studying. This lack of information and incomplete information will make it harder for more admissions officers to make decisions. Your job is to make it easier for them to make the decision on you, so leave no doubt. Next question. If I have good test scores and I've taken the SAT or ACT and performed well, will that even matter? What are the chances that schools will go test blind? There's almost no scenario, at least in our current thinking, where colleges will not accept scores for those who have tested or will test and have done well. That would be called test blind, where schools intentionally don't look at scores, even for students who want them to. We can't see any situation where this would apply. The students who have planned ahead and scored well should be rewarded and not penalized. So if you're one of those students, I would rest easy. Your hard work will not be in vain. Next question. What should I do with my downtime? There's no easy answer for this. And again, I go through case studies in episodes 24 and 25. But the bottom line is this. If you're anxious about this and you're wondering how things will work out, the best thing to do is to take action, massive action. Here's what I would do. I would double down on studying for the SAT or ACT if you haven't nailed a good score yet. I would double down on studying for AP exams. This is a place where you can make your mark. This is where you can prove that you've mastered the content. You want more data points, not fewer. I would double down on communicating with my teachers. Make sure that they know that you're committed to distance learning. Show up on time. Ask if there's some way that you can help. Provide feedback. Give teachers suggestions on how to better use Zoom. Most of them have no idea what they're doing. Help them out. 
especially if you plan to ask one of these teachers to write you a letter of recommendation. Now is the time to differentiate yourself from the crowd when the chips are down. Step up when things aren't going well. I would also double down on activities that show colleges what I care about, whether it's reading books or listening to podcasts or interviewing people on the phone or Skype or Zoom, taking online courses, serving others. Next question. Will my first semester grades next year in senior year matter more than in years past? I would think so. Remember, admissions is looking for ways to differentiate students. They're looking for ways to be impressed or underwhelmed. Since junior year was such a cluster in terms of real grades and pass-fails and distance learning, they may look especially closely at the courses you're taking and the grades you're getting first semester senior year. So certainly be ready to perform during that time. And the last question, what should sophomores be doing? What should sophomores be thinking about? What should their takeaways be? Well, for those sophomores who are listening, and I hope you are, this is a cautionary tale. You never know what life has in store. And for a process as important as college admissions, it's almost always better to be ahead of the curve versus behind. In fact, in life, it's often always better to be in front than lagging behind. So let this be a lesson. Do not make this mistake yourself. For all of you sophomore prep wellers who are already enrolled in the program, you will soon find a weekly video lesson in your online locker that walks you through how to prepare for the SAT or ACT this summer. Yes, this summer, a few months from now. If you follow the plan, you'll be ready to take your first tests early next year in August or September or October. This is where you want to be. Don't get caught. Don't get caught doing what everyone else is doing. Be proactive. If you're not yet enrolled in Preple Academy, enroll. I will give you the roadmap that helps you avoid all of these pitfalls. If you're a sophomore, you only have a few weeks left before your enrollment window closes. Prepl Academy is closed to juniors unless they've been a prep weller in ninth or 10th grade. If you want someone to guide you week by week to ensure that you're prepared for everything, even a worldwide pandemic, then I suggest you enroll today. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. If you know a parent, with an 8th grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, in this case, 11th grader in high school that might find this helpful, please share the show with them. You can do that by finding that small box with a little tiny arrow pointing up. That's called the share button. Click that share button. Text your friends this link to this episode with a little personal note from you recommending that they give it a listen. If you have questions, comments, or an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email. DM me on Instagram, prepwell underscore academy. Check out my blog, Facebook page, LinkedIn page. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to PrepWellAcademy.com and enroll your child today.